gospel reading for this morning comes from the ninth chapter of Luke. I'll be reading verses 28 to 36. It's Luke 9, 28 to 36. And let me invite you to listen for the word of the Lord this morning. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not even knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice Excuse me. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This is God's word. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O oh, Father in heaven, you who transfigured your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, so that his full glory could be beheld by his followers, we trust that through the work of your Holy Spirit, you will continue to transform our lives so that we would be worthy reflections of his glory. And now, God, may the words of my mouth and may the thoughts of our minds the meditations of our hearts, may they all be acceptable in your sight, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, I'm not exactly operating at 100% this morning. And this is not part of the sermon, this is just me telling you. I'm not operating at exactly 100% this morning. I've got my water bottle over there, I've had a steady stream of Hall's cough drops going down my gullet to this morning, so I'm trusting that all will be well. Uh, I got through 8.30, got through 9.45, uh, good Lord willing, we're going to get through 11. So if I fall into a coughing fit, there's nothing really wrong with me. Uh, we'll just wait for it to subside and we'll press on, okay? Well, uh, this is Transfiguration Sunday. Uh, this is a, a real holy day in the life of the church. It's a day that comes around every year at this time. And every year, either out of Matthew or Mark or Luke, we read the story of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, we do that on this Sunday of the year because we're about to enter into the season of Lent. We're about to enter into that 40-day, 40 40-night 40 period of preparation as we follow Jesus, as he goes down to Jerusalem, and as he prepares to be nailed to the cross of Calvary. In fact, the scripture tells us, after the story that we read today, that when Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, it says he set his face towards Jerusalem. He set his face towards Jerusalem. He knew after this pivotal moment happens in the middle of his ministry that the time had come for him to begin moving inevitably and inexorably down towards Jerusalem where he would bring to fulfillment the mission that God the Father had given him when he came into the earth. And so what that means is that both the event of the transfiguration as well as our celebration of it each year, they're very, very important. Because they remind us of the way in which God brought Jesus' majesty to full visibility in the sight of the disciples. And it's a reminder to us also of the deeply important season that we're about to enter into as we prepare to walk the Lenten journey yet again. 
Now, the way that I want to do that this morning is I want to do that by talking about not just the story of the transfiguration itself. I want to talk about three stories, all three of them from the Bible. And they will help us to prove what, for those of you who've been in Bible study with me before, what you've heard me say is one of the bedrock guides to reading the Bible, one of the, one of the core principles of how we interpret God's Word. And that is the principle that the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. That if we will just be patient, if we'll read God's Word deeply, that what we'll discover is that parts of the Bible will interpret other parts of the Bible. And in that way, they will reveal to us that the Scripture really is a unified whole. That what we're reading when we read the Bible is not just individual snippets, not just little verses here and there, but we're reading a canon. We're reading a unified witness and a testimony of God's Word and the one to whom God's Word is testifying all the way from Genesis to Revelation is, of course, the Son of God Himself. And so I think that reading the Bible this way by, by drawing from these different portions as a way to understand the transfiguration is especially important on this day where we're truly focusing on that time when God revealed the glory of Jesus in the fullest. So we're going to do this in three acts. Act one is going to be a story from the Old Testament, and the figure that it's going to center on is the figure of Moses. In Act 2, we're going to come back to Jesus himself and focus on the story of the transfiguration, where, of course, the central character is Jesus. And in the third act, we're going to turn to the Apostle Paul. It's going to be a passage that's going to revolve around Paul because by the Holy Spirit's guidance, Paul wrote it. But it's really a story that's about us. Because when we turn to the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, what we're going to find is that Paul is looking back not just to Jesus, but all the way to Moses as a way to help us understand what it means to be received into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin then by turning back to Moses, to this first act, to this first story. And in that, we're going to be looking at the story that Pastor Todd read for us earlier from the book of Exodus. And this is the story about what happened after God had anointed Moses and had called him to lead the Israelites up out of Egypt, had gone through the waters of the Red Sea, and had spent several weeks walking with them through the desert wastelands of the wilderness. Because after they traveled through those wastelands of the wilderness, Moses and the Israelites found that they came to the foot of a mountain. The mountain is called either Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. It actually has both names in the scriptures of the Old Testament. And when they got there to the foot of this mountain, God looked down upon the Israelites and he looked down upon his servant Moses and he actually spoke directly to Moses. What he said to Moses is this, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there. And Moses did. And when he got to the top, the scripture says, The glory of the Lord settled on the mountain, and the cloud covered it for six days. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. Now, what was God doing with Moses on that mountain? Well, in one sense, and in a very important sense, what God was doing with Moses was that he was giving him the law. You see, what God was preparing to do in a broader sense was to take those same Israelites and to carry them onward in their journey until they got to the promised land. But he didn't want them to be unequipped. He wanted the Israelites to know how they were to live with God and how they were to live with one another. And he knew that they were coming out of generations of slavery, that they were a nation because God had named them a nation, but in reality they were no nation at all. They hardly knew how to stick together on that journey through the wilderness. And so God had to give them a way for their lives to make sense. And it was going to be difficult, 
but it was going to give them the pattern for what it meant to live a holy life. And so God was giving that law to Moses that he might in turn give it to the Hebrew people. But in another sense, perhaps for Moses, a more personal sense, what God was doing up there on that mountain with Moses was that he was communing with Moses. Moses was actually there in God's very presence. And we know what an awesome, what a spectacular experience this was. Indeed, what a singular experience in human history. <clears throat> because the scripture says that when Moses came down from the top of Mount Sinai, he walked down into the valley to greet the Israelites, and they looked at him, and their mouths hung open, and they turned around, and they started running as fast as they could in the other direction. They were terrified of him. And the reason that they were terrified of him is because the effect of being in God's presence was such that his face was radiant. It was almost as if sunlight was coming out of Moses' pores. And it was, to the Israelites, a terror to behold. Now Moses called to them, and his brother Aaron, they called to them. The only way that they got them to come back is that he actually took a veil and he covered his face so that the glory of the Lord that had been shared with Moses was actually impeded by this veil because it was the only way that the Israelites could stand to be in Moses' presence. And yet we see, we see what a remarkable thing it was that at this pivotal time in the history of God's people, God's own presence had descended upon his mountain, his holy mountain in the form of a cloud, and indeed had come into Moses' own life, that he might be a beacon of God's light to the people, even if they had trouble beholding it themselves. Moses was the recipient of God's grace. But God's people, they were dumbstruck, not knowing what to think. Well, then if we turn to the scripture passage from the Gospel of Luke this morning, what we find is that there is another revelation of God on, yes, another mountain. And it even involves another cloud descending. But in this story, Jesus is the main figure that we focus upon. And he's been going around the Galilee, and he's been preaching, and he's been teaching, and he's been healing. And as he tended to want to do whenever he had been around the crowds too much, and whenever they had been pressing on him uh, too hardly, he wanted to retreat for a while so that he could reconnect with God the Father so that he could recharge his own spiritual batteries and he could reach out to the Father through prayer. And when he does that, he takes his inner circle of the inner circle up with him, Peter, James, and John, those three amongst the twelve with whom Jesus seemed to have the closest fellowship. And he carries Peter and James and John up on the mountain where he wants them to watch and to pray with him. Well, Peter, James, and John... They're fallible like you and me. And when Jesus asks them to stay there for a period of hours praying, they begin, to, of course, to nod off. And so what a surprise it is to them that when they open their eyes, it seems as if they are standing on the surface of the sun itself because they look up and there is Jesus who is basking in the full light of the Father's glory. Just as Moses had had his own face made radiant by the presence of God, Jesus was now transfigured before the disciples. And as they looked up before him, they saw him with two figures, with Moses and with Elijah. And the disciples were dumbstruck. Because here, standing before them, was Moses who represented the law. He was, after all, the one to whom the gift of the law was given. And Elijah, that greatest of the Old Testament prophets, who represents in some way in this scene the entire tradition of the prophets in Israel's history. And the law and the prophets whom God's people had listened to, sometimes faithfully and sometimes less so for so many centuries, were all culminating right there in the presence of Jesus. And James and John... They're so shocked they literally can't say anything. 
Peter talks. He just doesn't make a lot of sense. Peter says, what should we do, Lord? Should, should we build tents? Should we build dwellings here for you and for, for Moses and for Elijah? It's as if Peter thinks that the end of the world has come right then, and they're going to set up camp and, and wait for all the tribes to gather on that mountain. When Peter stops talking then, it says that a cloud descended upon them in the same way that the cloud had descended upon Moses on Mount Sinai over a thousand years before. And when that happened, a voice came out of the cloud. And the voice said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. You've had the law, you've had the prophets, but now I'm giving you my own son whose teaching will be pure and whose radiance you will bask in the glow of. Now, I have to tell you that as a preacher, I think the transfiguration is very difficult to preach. It doesn't lend itself to the kind of illustration or life application that we tend to want stories of, about Jesus to lend themselves to. You can think of any number of different stories involving Jesus, and you can think about the way in which we can take this very old gospel and make it relevant to our very contemporary lives easily. I mean, think about the feeding of the 5,000, right? Actually happens in Luke right before the transfiguration. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus breaks those barley loaves and divides those fish and he takes a little boy's lunch and he makes it feed a whole crowd full of people. And yet after all of that was over, the scripture tells us that there were 12 baskets of food left over that the disciples could pick up and carry forth and distribute to the hungry. And we read that story and we're able to say, wow, what a fantastic miracle, a sign of God's glory that Jesus is able to feed all of these people. And yet there's the lesson at the end, because just as the disciples gather up all of the leftovers and carry them forward, God too wants us to feed the hungry, to feed the poor in body and the poor in spirit. And that's true. But the transfiguration Transfiguration doesn't exactly work that way, does it? I mean, none of us were up there on the mountain with Peter and James and John. None of us beheld the Lord's glory in its purest form. And none of us are likely to encounter anything like that this side of heaven that we could use as an illustration. As I was preparing for this sermon, I read the uh, commentary by the great uh, preacher uh, and scholar Fred Craddock on this very issue, and I was actually a little comforted to find that Craddock, uh, a preacher orders of magnitude greater than I will ever be, that Fred Craddock too finds this text very difficult to preach on for the same reason that I just mentioned to you. Listen to what Craddock says. He says, there are in the scriptures accounts of experiences of Jesus serving the purposes of God for which analogies in our common experiences are just not easily found. One reads and studies these accounts, and the experience is one of awe and wonder and worship. The question, what in our lives is a suitable parallel, does not even seem appropriate. Applications and exhortations to these stories seem to just trivialize. <laughs> now, isn't that, isn't that a tremendous statement about the power of this scripture passage? It's as if God is not saying to us, here, read this story and learn what I want you to do, but he's rather saying to us, here, read this story and learn the true identity of the one who has come to save you. For behold, the one that you think of as the carpenter from Nazareth, or as the country rabbi, or even as the wise teacher or the charismatic preacher, this one is more than ever you guessed or ever you could have imagined. For this one is my very son. He is, he is God in the flesh. So behold him with awe and with wonder and with worship. 
Now, with all due respect to Craddock, I actually think that there is a way that we can relate this to our own lives, and that in a very practical way. Because if we go from Act 1 with Moses on Mount Sinai and through Act 2 with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, then we can go to Act 3, to that very passage from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians that I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon. And in that passage from 2 Corinthians 3, what we find is the Apostle saying this to us. He says, look, it's true that whenever Moses came down from the mount and spoke to the Israelites, he had to speak to them with a veil over his face. And the law is like this. The law is like a gift that God has given you, but it's something so terrible and it's something that is so awful, so makes you so full of awe that you cannot see it directly. You cannot behold God's presence directly. And it's like that when we read the Old Testament. It's like we're reading about God and God's love for us, but we're reading it with a veil over our faces. But those of you who have Jesus, Paul says, those of you who have the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ, things are different for you. Because for you, the veil, the veil has been removed. It's been lifted. It's been taken away. And you all, with veils raised, Paul says, you all can behold the glory of the Lord directly. You do not have to be afraid. You do not have to feel like you don't measure up. You don't have to feel like God is going to leave you in the outer darkness while he welcomes the rest of the sheep into his fold. Because you, with unveiled faces, can behold his glory and know that he has come in his glory with his arms stretched out wide to receive you, yes, even you, into the goodness of his mercy and of his love. And when you do that thing, then God will let you reflect the light of his glory and he will transform you from one degree of glory to another. And all of this, Paul says, all of this he will accomplish through the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I always look forward to the season of Lent with a little fear and trembling. Because when I think about the greatness and the majesty and the glory of our Lord Jesus preparing to be nailed to the cross of Calvary for my sins, and then I think about how weak and how prone to failure and how fallible I am, it kind of leaves me dumbstruck. And so to receive the message that all of that glory is there not to make me cower in fear, but to make me stand up, to look directly into his face and to say, yes, Lord Jesus, please come to me too. Well, that's just about the best news that any of us could receive. So let's receive it together. Let's prepare to walk with him on the way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.